Thank you very much indeed. And um, good evening to everybody. I'm incredibly um, <laughs> proud and happy to be with you this evening and to, that it's um, possible to um, present in this way. So I'm just um, making sure that I can um, share my screen with you. It's working to... perfectly. It's working. Okay. So my ridiculously long title um, really encompasses precisely what Peladan was and what he tried to do um, to sort of um, spark a spiritual revolution through the media of esoteric arts and literature. And um, Peladan is a frustrating figure and he's as frustrating um, to research as he probably is to try and uh, to try and understand and as he probably was in real life. Um, people come to his work from usually either from references uh, within Ro Rosicrucian sources um, or through uh, references in art history quite often as a footnote until recently with the um, huge Guggenheim exhibition um, mystical symbolism dedicated to the Salon de, de Rosecroix. Um, and I think that's probably brought him more into people's consciousness more recently. But that didn't really cover, didn't really look closely at um, who the man was or what he really did. So this will be familiar to some of you, but by way of a quick biographical introduction, um, for those less familiar with Peladan or all the aspects of his um, work, um, Peladan was initiated into Rosicrucianism fairly early as a young man by his brother and the key points uh, to hold on to about his sprawling work um, are that he always saw art as something that should serve a social and spiritual purpose and that this should be carried out within um, everyday life, within society. So. Uh, Peladan is often claimed um, as an occultist or as an esotericist, but one key point of differentiation is to note that he did not think this should be done in secret, and I'll come back to that and qualify it a little bit later. Um, one other point on which he's very well known is um, the fact is his role within the French occult revival, his association with major figures such as Papus, such as uh, Stanislas de Gaeta, and um, the very public quarrel that they had that led to him taking um, his own path and creating his a separate um, order, which is also fairly misunderstood. Um, you'll see on the bullet point where I've noted uh, the order of the Catholic Rose Cross Temple and Grail that he founded after he broke away from Papus and de Gaeta, I put an asterisk next to the word Catholic, and um, I'll deal with that more a little later, but suffice it to say that um, many scholars up until now have often interpreted Paladin as being um, a very dogmatic, very um, deeply faithful Roman Catholic, at which he was Roman Catholic, but Paladin, in fact, used the term completely differently, and this is often missed but it's extremely important for understanding his worldview and therefore his work and therefore his impact. Um, Paladin clarifies this within his uh, writing that he um, used Catholic in the Greek sense and the Greek sense of the word means universalist. And Paladin was all for a reunification of religions um, and very frequently quoted uh, Greek theologians um, saying that he felt that Catholic doctrine had gone in the wrong direction. So it's kind of important to try to, when we're trying to understand who this man was, um, these are some of the clues to his thought process. Um, although until recently Paladin only really showed up as a footnote um, or as um, this rather curious eccentric figure, um, what's often forgotten is that apart from his influence on symbolist art, which I'll talk more about in a second, 
Um, he also had a huge impact on modernist literature and um, both within Europe, in Sweden, Italy, Germany, they loved his work. Strindberg loved his work and promoted it in um, Sweden quite extensively. Um, but also as far afield as Latin America, where again, he had um, a significant impact. And these things are often forgotten through the focus on um, some other elements of his uh, work. And also through focus on his incredibly eccentric personality. Um, Paladin had a, a kind of sad end. He quarreled with pretty much everybody in his immediate circle and um, fell out of favour fairly quickly. By the time he died, he was um, already sort of uh, being forgotten. And sadly, there are many scholars who um, have simply dismissed him as an, being as an eccentric buffoon, um, who organized some interesting salons, but is of little interest. Um, very briefly, these are just, this gallery is just some of the major figures um, in Paladin's milieu, in the milieu of the French occult revival, uh, people he rubbed shoulders with, um, but, did not remain close to, apart from Papus, although they did, um, the relations did grow cold between them, um, they still wrote of each other with um, respect and um, a sense of appreciation until the end. And I'm sorry about the terribly fuzzy photograph, but that's the best quality I could find, um, to just give a sense of the group of, um, within Paladin's order in its heyday. So we're in this milieu of um, this strange fin de siècle revival of um, in, an interest in occultism, which itself has specific roots that I'll look at a little bit later. And then we've got this incredibly strange figure um, with all these sort of contrasting and perhaps contradictory characteristics. As I noted, he is best remembered, and I'm sure that... Um, but, and I'm sure that most of you have come across him primarily um, for his organization of the Salons de la Rose Croix. Um, I've picked just three paintings as um, embodying the essence of these Salons by artists, artists that Paladin worked closely with, um, because these are kind of imbued with the message that he repeatedly said he wanted to share. Um, on the left you have um, Carlos Schwab's work, uh, work um, this idea of um, the conflict but also the need for integration between uh, matter and the divine and there are whole dimensions to this in Paladin's work that I'll look at a little bit later. We have a similar concept in the centerpiece uh, by Jan Turop which the artist himself explains as depicting humanity at different degrees, at different levels of um, uh, spiritual evolution. The ones caught underneath the Sphinx of the, uh, and those who are on their way to ascension. Uh, so again, this very much embodies uh, many of Paladin's ideas and the Sphinx is a very a significant figure and symbol that we'll meet again later. And lastly, Orpheus in the Underworld by Jean Delville, who was um, perhaps one of the artists closest to Paladin's heart and who carried on some of the work in the context of um, producing uh, esoterically minded exhibitions in his native Belgium after, and with Paladin's blessing in fact, after um, the salons had ended in Paris. Um, and the figure of Orpheus is again key to a lot of Paladin's work. So. Um, Perhaps these are some of the images that many of you will be familiar with from the salons. And these are also some of the main concepts on which they were built. These are from um, Paladin's um, artistic uh, manifesto, if you like, L'art idéaliste et mystique, in which he tried to lay out his um, perspective on what art should be, on what art should embody in order to serve the specific purposes that he had envisioned. Um, and these have been quoted very widely, but uh, just to gather a, get a sense of them, 
art, he wrote, is man's effort to realize the ideal. And it's important to perceive that notion of ideal in um, the platonic sense, an idea which has not yet descended into matter, something that is so um, nebulous, that is so far past our um, sen sensory perception that um, it doesn't have a form that our senses can grasp. And Peladan's whole point was art can give that form, art can provide that form. So to realize the ideal, to form and represent um, the supreme idea, the idea par excellence, the abstract idea. And I'm sorry, I'm stalling, but I something's blocking part of my screen, so I can't actually read all of it to you, which I shouldn't be doing anyway. But this, there's this idea of artists attempting to materialize the idea of the ineffable, the idea of God, of an angel, of the Virgin Mother, and um, making the invisible visible, which is, for, for Peladan again, the true purpose of art and its only reason for existence. And he put out this sort of call to artists um, in order to organize his salons, uh, speaking directly to them in the catalogue of the first salon in 1892. Artist, you know that art descends from heaven. It is a little piece of God within a painting. If you create a perfect form, a soul will come and inhabit it. Brothers in all the arts, I am sounding a battle cry. Let us form a holy militia for the salvation of idealism. We will build the temple of beauty. For the artist is a priest, a king a mage. Powerful words. And they had a powerful effect because, of course, the salons, especially the first one, um, had a response that Paris had never seen. Tens of thousands of people thronged through the streets, especially for the first one. And they were Peladans, in a sense, Peladans own um, interpretation of the Wagnerian Gesamtskunst work, the um, an attempt to synthesize all of the arts. They had uh, theatrical plays, they had uh, poetry readings, music by Eric Satie um, to sort of create this um, artistic synthesis and production of artwork, not all of which um, is uh, spoken of well by art critics and historians, but that served this aim that Peladan seems to be expressing here of manifesting the invisible and bringing it into matter. And the whole idea was that by bombarding the unsuspecting public with materials such as this, they could not help but um, respond to it in a way that would spark evolution. And if this happened on a, um, on a grand scale, on, on, on a, on a city-wide scale, on a country-wide scale, this is what could ultimately lead to um, spiritual evolution. Peladan's purposes with the salons are understood by some scholars, discussed by some. Unfortunately, many art critics also write them off as just an oddity, as an eccentricity, something that's just a little bit unfashionable, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and sort of, um, at least it was something interesting that sparked this peculiar set of happenings in the Fonds de Siècle. Um, and as I say, it's what Peladan is best remembered for. But there's a problem with that. There's a huge problem with that. And Peladan himself tells us why. Because Peladan does denounce the salons. And Peladan felt it had all been a huge mistake. And this is him writing um, in 1912, but there are other references to this in um, work written earlier after the salons had ended. And he says, I remember that time without pleasure. He speaks of himself in the third person as well, though. The salons which lasted six years were fatal to their organizer. What was he going to do in a gallery of artists? The big gestures, the enthusiastic words stirred up so much malice. Monsieur Peladin compromised his prestige as a writer. It's funny, I um, do occasionally, quite frequently, receive correspondence um, inquiring about Peladin. People, um, especially now or recently, are rediscovering him. And um, one, of the, one of the questions I get most often is, um, 
hello, I'm an art student, I'm studying Paladin. Could you please tell me of his most famous paintings? Paladin was a writer. And this misconception, what, what has struck me and what I found most surprising is that time and again, he is remembered only for the salons. Yet, if we listen to what he has to say, um, we see a different situation. And these are unpublished notes for an autobiography that never manifested. He speaks of himself in the third person. And he wrote of himself, Peladan will one day be the object of detailed study, the novelist of La Decadence Latine, the playwright of Babylon and La Promethée, the philosopher of L'Amphitheatre des Sciences Mortes, the art critic of La Decadence Esthétique, the savant of ideas and forms, and finally the zealot of the Rose Croix, is an infinitely curious student who built six careers simultaneously, of which one alone would have been sufficient for the activity of a writer. And looking through Paladin's work, I cannot tell you the number of times that he um, repeatedly says, why are things being missed? Why am I not being listened to? Why are people misinterpreting me? Now that question why is a whole other conversation. Um, but what I would like to emphasize with this is um, when I was invited to deliver this talk, one of the key areas of focus was um, the salons. But Peladan wasn't just the salons. Those were six years of his life and he died at 60. Um, so what I'm getting at, especially here, is how, how certain, and a certain emphasis has been given to aspects of his work, but not to others. And this emphasis has traveled through the scholarship up until now. Um, and unfortunately, many misperceptions are repeated, even in the most recent um, work on Paladin attached to the Guggenheim exhibition, that um, the focus is skewed from the actual totality of the material. Now, I'm sorry for the garish colours here, but they'll come in handy later, so just bear with me. This is Paladin's legacy, apart from the salons. We have 21 novels with symbolic plot lines and layered esoteric content, five moralistic novels for younger readers, five theoretical works on aesthetics alone, a seven volume theoretical series, which actually not only offers the social and political impl implementation of his theories, but it deciphers the novels. The, the nonfiction is key to the fiction. Um, various uh, other esoteric and philosophical texts, and these come slightly later in his life, six plays, and thousands upon thousands of art reviews, uh, articles and essays for the general public. So we're looking at a vast body of work with a multivalent character with lots of different forms of expression that in itself is divided up, and I'm getting this from Paladin, this is not my interpretation, the documentation is within his work. It is consciously designed to aim at different sets of people, not divided up by profession or by area of interest, um, not divided up as we might do today for the general public and for uh, intellectuals and scholars, but divided up based on their place in a spiritual hierarchy that Peladon himself developed. But actually, it's just Plato. It's just based on Plato, <laughs> um, which is something I've also been able to uh, definitively um, prove um, through uh, looking at the work itself rather than at third party sources. Um, you'll see in the key at the bottom of this slide, um, okay, young readers are <laughs> what it says on the tin. Um, I've got initiates and I've got this strange word, animique. And les animiques, we'll meet uh, Peladan's explanation a little later. These were members of the public that he felt were close to a spiritual awakening, but who hadn't quite got there yet. They needed a little nudge, they needed a little spark, they needed something to wake them up. This was the audience at whom the salons were aimed, um, as well as the bulk of his work, uh, as you'll see here. Um, it, and for initiates, he provided the manuals, the theoretical key to help them piece his work back together. And 
the other thing to observe is that from the mid 1880s, Peladan had already planned out the work he intended to do. He had already designed, didn't fully follow it, but it was close enough. His output came very close to his early designs for his work. Um, he had already planned out this huge uh, oeuvre uh, to um, try to uh, impact as many different layers of society as possible. And what is immediately obvious when you actually get into his work is that there is an in immense, there's an incredible consistency there. He, his writing is not easy to get into, but it's consistent. His references are consistent. And in later life, when he got tired of being misunderstood, he actually published an anthology in which he pointed out the correspondences between his various works. But this has all been ignored it seems, up till now. So when I came to look at this, at Peladin and his work, I came through the salons too, you see, because I was interested at the time in understanding um, the interplay between art and esoteric thought. But it became, and I thought that I was going to be writing a history, a simple history. But it turned out biographies of Peladin had already been written and written well in terms of his life. His life. The problem came with his work because what had happened was scholars had taken one look, followed the disciplinary sort of bounds that had already shaped their approach to Peladan, and sort of said, oh, no, 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 this is turgid, this is florid, this is, this is bad writing, this isn't what we, uh, we, we used to, what's all this uh, occult, esoteric, strange stuff, no, 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 none of that, he's never going to be remembered as a writer, um, let's look at the bits that actually impacted, had a wider impact. Which meant that scholars upon scholars actually just read the secondary literature on Peladan. They, wrote, they read what other scholars had, had written. And this happened for <laughs> several decades, meaning that nobody ever actually went back and looked at the work itself. And not only that, but when it comes to the esoteric content of his work, well, we know that we've only had a methodology for looking at esoteric content for the last it, within academia for the last 30 years or so. And even there, there have been methodological debates that have been ongoing. Um, although I think we're reaching a good place now. So um, when I came to this as a doctoral student at the time, my instinct was very strongly, hang on, why has nobody looked at the literature? Why has nobody actually looked at what the man himself was trying to say before we get into deciding whether it's good or bad literature? That needs doing too, but sh surely we should have a map of it first, I said to myself. And so, um, and then because I do also have a background in literature, I thought, well, okay, but from which perspective, which framework am I going to use? Um, and of course, it, it, it became clear very quickly, you can't suddenly apply a framework that belongs to a completely different time period. For example, um, even from the, the claiming Peladan for the fantastique genre, which could be done, which has actually been suggested. Surely we should have a map of it first. So I went looking, and this is what I found from theoreticians that I felt justified my decision to look at Peladan from the ground up, reserve judgment until the end, and see what would come out mm. of it. Um, contextualization and focus on the actual work must precede analysis, says Svetan Todorov, who is the theoretician par excellence of fan uh, fantasy literature in the French context. Um, Northrop Fry, one of the um, top scholars to um, bring Blake into um, sort of modern understanding. Um, Fry had the same problem with Blake, that he had been misquoted, he had been misperceived, layers upon layers of um, somewhat biased readings of Blake, um, had meant that he had his whole body of work had not really been looked at or given a square deal, um, which Blake himself was aware of in his lifetime. And as Fry says, First of all, Blake's poetry, from the shortest lyric to the longest prophecy, must be taken as a unit and judged by the same standards. And 
This is what I have come to say about Paladin. And secondly, equally important, as all other poets are judged in relation to their time, so should Blake be placed in his historical and cultural context. So I've seen scholars looking at Paladin, looking at his activities, looking at his work, but taking it out of context. Um, and this problem is, this is not, I, I don't blame scholars, I blame discipline, disciplinary boundaries for this. Because depending on one's training, as a, say one is a literary scholar or an art historian, you're going to come at it with a set of priorities that your discipline uh, places value on. And myself as a scholar of um, the history of esotericism, I was told to focus on um, the reception and transmission of ideas within Paladin's work. And so these are the challenges one faces when dealing with work like this. And um, Peladan is actually just a case study because whenever one encounters um, a polyvalent body of work such as this that incorporates esoteric thought, um, one is going to come up against these challenges and there are decisions that need to be made. Are we going to write a historiography as until recently in um, the methodology pertaining to studying esoteric material? Uh, the emphasis had been more strictly on a historical approach. But if we do that, is it going to be biographical? Is it going to be an intellectual history? And what are we going to have to leave out if we focus on these choices? If on the other hand, we decide we're looking at a body of artwork, which was the decision made by the Guggenheim, um, then taking a purely art historical approach to it necessitated cutting out Paladin altogether. So he became very unimportant. And again, the same misperceptions about him were repeated, unfortunately, within the uh, catalogue describing the exhibitions, which is a shame because it was an opportunity to really rehabilitate him. What, and if we do look at the literature, which theoretical framework are we going to pick? Are we going to take this eccentric author from the fin de siècle, from within the French occult revival, who did all these things and apply a formalist, framework to him? How about, um, which critical theory shall we go with? I mean, gender theory, I'm sure a lot of interesting conclusions could be reached, but is it appropriate? And these, and as you'll see on this slide, obviously, which I'm not going to read through every line, but um, for each of these decisions that one must make as a scholar, on the right, you see the problems with making those decisions. And if one does, as I decided to, try an interdisciplinary approach, how does one reconcile these disciplinary concerns and how does one justify each of the choices made to look at each part without reinventing the wheel? Because interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary scholarship does not need reinventing. What it seems we must do when faced with material like this is adapt depending on the situation. So I took Northrop Fry as my lead when approaching Paladin. And I looked at, and I took those two points, listen to what he has to say for himself and judge his work on its own merits and context, context, context. And I can't emphasize the word context enough because the minute we take a step back to look at Paladin, and the influences, and all of these are traced through his work. There is documentation um, for every single one of these points. Um, we have, in the broader scheme of things, we're in the aftermath, the late aftermath of the French Revolution, but we're still in a circle of people, especially Paladin's family circle, with strong monarchist and legitimist leanings. Paladin has been claimed as a legitimist. I made this mistake in some of my early um, conference papers and claimed him as a legitimist. Actually, Paladin was a pacifist who thought the army should be abolished and uh, hated racism with a passion and thought all peoples should be joined in one great multicultural um, global humanity. This is in the Paladin's um, own hand, you see. Um, we're in a context with widespread secularism and social reform of wiping away anything people used to believe, with, believe in. And politically, monarchies are crumbling and tensions leading up to the First World War are building within Europe. 
And if you imagine the uncertainty we're currently living with, imagine that uncertainty, watching the world you knew crumble. We know what that feels like, you see. And as part of all this, we have the ongoing scientific revolution. We have, with, with the new secularism, we have new encyclopedic approaches to knowledge. We have taxonomy, we have organization. Um, and this becomes the only way of validate, validating knowledge that was hitherto treated of in a more allegorical fashion. And that's again a whole other discussion in and of itself. But the anti-enlightenment um, movement, the counter-enlightenment movement, the French anti-philosoph movement, um, incorporated and um, this agglomeration of epistemologies which consisted of this symbolic understanding of history itself and the symbolic interpretation of knowledge that had gone before and this a, a, a sort of synthesis of knowledge from a completely different perspective and this diagram which is very very much my own visual kind of mind map of the influences acting on Peladan the shapes and sizes of the arrows are deliberate. So um, where you see something like Jewish Kabbalah on its own at the top there, that's not because I didn't have space. That's because Paladin ignored the Christianized version of Kabbalah that came through the Renaissance. And he went back and he consulted rabbis and he studied Kabbalah direct and the Zohar. He, he mentions this, this is again documented directly with the people who knew it best. But he was wise enough to look at it on its own and not as part of the synthesis, the syncretic synthesis that came through the Renaissance. Um, sources such as Burma, Ficino, Pico, um, they, they reached him and he was well aware of their work, but they reached him also in this weird cluster of other influences, as you see in the diagram. And the two greatest influences of all on Peladan and his thought process were Plato and Fabre d'Olivet. And there's no time to go into the detail of that, but those are the, especially Platonic thought, became Peladin's method of organizing his um, work and his ideas. Now, I'm painfully aware that I'm going over time a little bit, but if you'll just allow me to round that off from the general to the specific, if we look at Peladin's motivation, so we look at his context and now we look at what actually fired the man. He said, we are in the midst of intellectual anarchy and initiation, which he saw as the direct understanding of the divine plan, can only be the privilege of a few superior minds whose duty it is, he thought, to direct the others. He divided humanity. This is direct from an interview that he gave. He divided humanity into these three classes based on the degree to which they were intellectually and spiritually aware. So consummate fools, which correspond to um, Plato's mob or ochlos, uh, the anemic whom we met earlier, who are the people on the verge of an awakening, and intellectuals who he saw as the initiated. And I content myself, Peladan said, to translate ideas into aesthetic forms accessible to those who form the second class, the anemique, the artists and lovers of art. So if we ask the man himself, he does tell us, and he tells us this is 1893, the time of the interview is the time of the salons. He told us exactly what he was trying to do. And madcap or not, it takes us to a different place when we're trying to evaluate and understand um, what he was about. Mm. But I would also um, emphasize, I'll just go back for a second, that every one of these influences impacting on Peladan's thought process and work, each of them comprises and constitutes a different way of knowing, a different approach to knowledge, a different approach to um, thinking about these topics. And so if we're going to trace them, again, we need to be as faithful to them as we need to be to our subject. And that's before we begin interpreting or reaching conclusions. Um, I'm not going to go through these in any detail because again, um, I am conscious of the time, but the result of all of this was that Peladan created a 
a hierarchy of being based loosely on both Plato and scripture. And this started with the creation story and came all the way down to different temperaments and different characteristics within humanity. And all of this he built into what I've called a legendarium, which is literally an act of world building. I borrowed this term from Tolkien studies, whereby it's literally um, um, building a universe um, using myth and characterization that Paladin borrowed from the sources that had come to him through these philosophical histories, through Fabre d'Olivet, through Plato and ancient mythology, to end up believing that there was this structured hier hierarchy to human existence and that art was the only, was the key pivotal uh, point for developing the human creative impulse and thus achieving reintegration with the divine. And this, the only um, thing to really hold on to from this uh, table of correspondences, this is where I've tallied Platonic thought with Paladin's work, and from there with corresponding esoteric sources. But every one of these is documented within Paladin's work. I'm not just drawing arbitrary uh, similarities. I'm not just looking at arbitrary similarities. All of these have been documented through looking at what Paladin himself says about his influences and um, his aims. And it turns out that the new epistemology or the new enlightenment epistemology of um, trying to scientize knowledge was not lost on Paladin and he was extremely well aware of the difference between allegorical interpretations and um, accurate historical interpretations and we find this in his work as well. So he tried to organize his own set of sets of correspondences in this neat organized manner. You wouldn't know it to look at his writing, to be honest. I mean, it's sprawling, it's vast, but the patterns are there and they're consistent. Um, again, they were, there's no real time for this and it's less important, but this is just to show you that there are recurrent, you can boil down the material in Paladin's work to recurrent characters, very specific symbolic settings, recurrent plot lines because he only had one message he was just playing with different ways of getting it out and that's why we get so much repetition because he's trying to reach everybody and a very limited set of recurrent symbols which include Orpheus um, because of course Orpheus is patron of the arts and the androgyne because Peladan takes the um, Plato symposium as his starting point for his creation story, the rending of the primordial androgyne and the need to reunite it. The Sphinx is our intermediary, the mystagogue, and a meta symbol. And assorted mythical deities who are sometimes angels in the stories and sometimes uh, deities from mythology are the guides, the wise guides of humanity. And all of this leads to a question as to whether we should reconsider work such as Paladin's as a form of a different genre of literary esotericism, which is a form of literature whose aim is to initiate the reader within the act of reading. And there are specific characteristics, I've written about this elsewhere, so I, don't, I won't go into any detail, but the point being, it is very different from literature that simply uses esotericism as a plot device. So to my Liter literature scholars, uh, my literary scholar friends out there, perhaps this is something to be aware of. Is the purpose simply to, to entertain or is there an act of awakening being sought within the structure of the novel itself? And with Paladin, it seems that that is there. Whether it works is another story. So, um, although Paladin is best remembered for the art of the salons, what I'd like to close with is the art that Paladin himself chose to represent himself with, you see, because the salons are the representation of the artist's interpretation of Paladin's call. But if you look at Paladin's frontispieces and his emblems and the seals that he commissioned, that he chose to represent himself, once again, there's an incredible internal consistency because 
first one I've selected here is the frontispiece to his first ever novel, Le Vie Supreme, by Felicien Rops. And we see a decadent Paris, death, decay, dressed up in fine velvet and lace. And this is exactly Paladin's description and understanding of the society he found himself in, which was rotten on the inside and whose social strictures and uh, strict rules made it impossible for humanity to awaken to its higher purpose. The second one um, is my own rendition, but it's a faithful rendition of the emblem originally designed by Rops again, that Peladan used on his early novels. And we have the, the Sphinx, we have the Mystagogue, we have the Temple Guardian, we have the figure that guards the entrance. Where on the first page of a novel designed to affect inner awakening in the unsuspecting reader. And the legend reads, vive unguibus emus, who live under her tooth and claw. If we recall Turop's painting of the Sphinx, some humans are still completely blissfully unaware, but always groaning under the weight of the Sphinx, always under her claws. Whereas awakening and getting past uh, solving the Sphinx's riddle is um, what Peladan hoped to provoke and challenge people into doing. Finally, perhaps clearest of all, is the seal that he commissioned for his Rose Croix order, the seal of the Rose Croix, um, commissioned uh, by Peladan from uh, Francois Merintier, and um, doesn't it doesn't take much to decipher this one the um spirit descending into the chalice of the grail um within the vesica pisces um and these are the symbols that he chose to represent himself and his work with and so my sense is that before approaching a figure or a body of work like this one really should start with asking the simple question what did he have to say for himself? And in the case of Paladin, he left an awful lot. Perhaps he left too much. And that's why there's been this much confusion, confusion up till now. But as we see, there is actually a structure and order underpinning it if we give it the chance. So um, in conclusion, I do hope very soon to be able to share the full breadth of my work with uh, on Paladin. Um, it's been written for a long time, but life gets in the way, as it does. Um, but the thought I'd like to leave you all with is the, this idea of the interdisciplinary toolbox, the idea that disciplinary boundaries are often a hindrance rather than a help, um, an invitation to my fellow scholars to look outside their disciplinary comfort zones, and especially if you're looking at esoteric material, because the way these ideas have traveled through time and the way these clusters have emerged these are not homogeneous traditions and in his introduction professor kilsch has said i thoroughly agree that in fact um esoteric and occult thought it seems to have been marginalized and i've just shown you how that can happen um with the with peladan as just as a case study but actually it's impacted many, many layers of society, many, many layers of culture and of the way we think and learn. So to my mind, the only way to counter this sort of segmented understanding of um, materials such as this is through more integration. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need huge methodological treatises, but we do need to be aware that some of these disciplinary boundaries need to come down a little bit further and allow the topics to dictate to us which approach we're going to use so that we don't it doesn't turn into overkill and so that we don't have phenomena such as the grave misinterpretations of Peladan that we've seen up till now. I've um, gone over time I know and I'd like to leave time for questions so thank you very much for listening.